Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brighter Wealth Show, where we help Christians become brighter stewards of God's wealth. I'm, my name is David Sandy. I'm a financial advisor. And today we have uh, Katie Jones, who is a financial money coach, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, some, some of her progress through uh, being a financial coach. And then we have a couple of really engaging topics I'm excited about, how to redeem your role as a financial steward, what it means to honor the Lord with all of your wealth, and then the three most overlooked areas of financial stewardship. So with that, welcome to the show, Katie. Yeah, thanks so much, David. I am honestly really excited for this conversation today. We've been kind of chatting about this for a while and something that I know that both of us are really passionate about. So yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, likewise. So I want to just get started off and talk about a couple of things I think that are overarching themes uh, for anyone that's talking about uh, finances and uh, kind of a biblical perspective on finances. Um, and the first one is stewardship. And then the second one is contentment. So I wanted to just pick your brain and see kind of what are your thoughts on stewardship? What does it mean to be uh, a financial steward? And that'll lead us into the first talking point here, how to redeem your role as a financial steward. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think stewardship is really about understanding that what we have is not our own. We believe as Christians that what we have is from God, whether it is our time, our energy, or our money. Um, that includes every single resource that we have. I actually really love the concept of being a manager of the money that we have. So being a money manager um, is kind of equivalent to being a good steward. So uh, since our money is not our own, the really important question is what would our boss in a sense, our CEO want us to do with the money that we have? So we have to reference the Bible. We have to ask God um, and be in communion with him to understand how to manage these resources that he's given us. So that's that's kind of in essence what it means to be a good steward of the resources that he's given us. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I'm just going to share a little bit about my story. So my perspective on stewardship really started when I learned about biblically responsible investing because I started to think, how does God view my investments? But then the second question was, well, how does God care about my investments? I know God cares about my giving because the Bible speaks so much about our finances and, uh, you know, kind of the unrighteous mammon in this world. Um, but it really made me kind of reflect on if God cares this much about where I give and where I invest, what else, what are the other, you know, what's the other 90% doing and how am I honoring him in that? So that was my really, my first um, kind of light into stewardship. What was it for you that you, you started thinking like, maybe I should become a better steward of God's money? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, super good question. Part of my testimony and, and financial testimony too is my husband and I, um, so I actually started out in my career as a property manager for other people who owned rental properties. So I was helping them manage and rent them out and everything. And I eventually thought like, well, hey, if this Joe Schmo that I'm helping manage his property can do it, why can't I? So I, my husband and I got married and we started investing in real estate pretty soon, only three months after we got married. And, um, I just kind of followed what everybody else was doing. I, I was a big follower, um, still am pretty involved in bigger pockets and their podcasts and all of their blog posts. And I was consuming all of it very quickly, um, and applying a lot of what I was learning there. And honestly, it was, it, it kind of, hit me after we bought our first rental property that this rental property is up. Uh, it's from God. It is his, it is God's rental property. And I need to manage this as if God were watching me, you know, if he, as if he were my manager and CEO looking over my shoulder. And so I wanted to be a good steward of this property. And that kind of started getting that ball rolling of, okay, well, I want to be a faith forward landlord. I want to honor God with this rental property. But that also meant the money that I was using to invest in it, as well as just all the other resources. It was kind of this snowball effect. And, and I really wanted to. So I started seeking the Bible and, and reading it as if I, you 
you know, as if my life depended on it in a sense, I, I started consuming it to see what God wanted me to be doing versus what the world was telling me to do, which was just to make as much money as possible. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be profitable, but I knew that there was a greater purpose to this property. So yeah, yeah good for me. Yeah, I think uh, so. I, I'm all, I was also, you know, my wife and I did uh, a number of uh, flips, live in flips, yeah, and, right. and and we <laughs> we kind of went on the cycle of doing that and and making good profits from them. And we had a couple mm-hmm. rental properties as well, but one of the things that really struck me and i think uh and i just did a youtube about this but the pursuit of financial independence which which actually just ties into our yes. second point here is is of contentment whenever you whenever i went down that rabbit hole of how can i pursue financial independence what was the what was the motivation behind it it was really to be independent of any source yes. of, of financial uh, you know financial worries the problem with that was though that i was i was leaving god out of the equation as well i wasn't even depending on him for my, for my finances and for, for, you know, building wealth and, and all those things. So I think that really leads to the second kind of overarching theme for today, which is contentment. And I know Paul talks about godliness with contentment is great gain. So, and we're going to talk about contentment more, but I want to kick off, um, you know, this, uh, this time with the question, how to redeem your role as a financial steward. And the word redemption is obviously more of a biblical word. We hear this a lot with, uh, you know, the story of Ruth, uh, and Boaz and, and kind of buying something and purchasing it for another purpose. And so I want to get your thoughts on, uh, I mean, we, we kind of talked about our role as stewards, right? We don't own anything. It belongs to God. How would we manage it, you know, knowing that he's coming back? I always, I always give people this example. In college, my pastor has asked me to watch their house for a week. And I, of course, I was, you know, super nervous being in their house. Never, you know, wasn't super close. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. we were friends, but, you know, it was kind of different just being in someone else's house. But I, I always said, you know, when y'all come back, this this house is going to be better than it looks <laughs> by the time y'all come back. Because I was just so nervous. I wanted to honor them and obviously be a blessing to them. But I think here in this life, we have to have that same mindset of how can we be a blessing to those people that God mm-hmm. put it, puts in our life. We're not really here for us. And God, God is coming back. And when he, when he does, will he find us faithful? So I want to hear your thoughts on what, what does it mean to redeem your role as a financial steward? Yeah. Oh, that is, I mean, honestly, it's, I think it starts again with recognizing first, nothing is our own. Um, I really like the verse. Um, I think it's in first Peter one. Um, that talks about how God isn't here. Like though he isn't here, we don't see him. Um, even though, yeah, even though we don't believe in or don't see him, we believe in him and he fills us with this inexpressible joy. Um, and when we think about that and understand that our joy comes from God, we can, we can let go of needing money to do for us, what only God can do, bring us that joy. And so many times we start with our money problems and thinking that, okay, if I have all these money problems. I just need practical wisdom. I need more money. I need a budget. I need to pay off my debt. And we kind of think this like checklist of things, but to redeem our finances really starts with God. It starts mm-hmm. with accepting the grace that he alone can give gives us second chances to be able to to do what we need to do to have that contentment like we just talked about just finding that contentment first and saying even though i feel like i my my money situation is a mess i can i can breathe i can let go i can lay it down at the feet of jesus and say god this is yours i need Mm -hmm. you to give me those practical steps to do and a lot of times it kind of starts with something that we don't always think about is just giving our, like redeeming our situation is accepting that grace, moving forward and, and just giving it back to God and releasing it. And I think that that's really where we start when it comes with redeeming our financial situations is accepting that we can't do it on our own. <laughs> we yeah. really can't go and and do all the practical stuff. And that will never fix anything until we see God and and the peace and the joy that he brings alone. Yeah. I want to, I want to mention two scriptures. One that's talks about redeeming your time. 
Uh, this is in Ephesians 5. It says, See then that you walk circumspe circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Um, wow. Another one in Colossians 4 says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. And both of these, the redeeming the time is related to you know wisdom and then also how that we walk uh, circumspectly, right? As wise stewards, I believe, of God's well. So I think this concept of, of redemption, and but also redeeming our time. I know something that I prayed after kind of coming out of the financial independence movement was God, just please help me to redeem this time that I that I felt like maybe I was wasting my time just pursuing this idol in my life. And I really was, I wasn't really focused on God and focusing on how can I please, how can I please God? How can I be a blessing to others and, and uh, be generous with other people? I, you know, I was continuing to give through, um, through that time of, of, you know, flipping houses and, and, you know, producing, you know, earthly wealth. But I really wasn't, uh, in my opinion, storing up those true riches, um, which, which reminds me of this other scripture that's in Luke 16. Um, it says, he who is faith, faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Therefore, you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon. Who will commit to you to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? So I think that it ties perfectly in what you're saying about how can we redeem not only our, our wealth, but also the time that we maybe have pursued something that wasn't something that wasn't godly. Yeah, definitely. Actually, I'd love to read um, a quote that, um, so one of my favorite books, we're, we're, we're talking all about like redeeming our finances. One of my favorite books um, is Redeeming Money by Paul David Tripp. If you're not familiar with Paul David Tripp out there, I highly recommend anything that he writes. Um, he has an amazing quote uh, that I just love to share about this kind of idea. Um, he says, you don't need, uh, you don't just need a good plan for dealing with your financial mess. You need forgiving, rescuing, and transforming grace, just the kind of grace that you already have as a child of God. Hmm. And, and again, like when, when we come at our money mess, you know, if we're struggling with finances, whether, whether you have lots of money or a little bit of money, you can, everybody can have a financial mess no matter where they're at with their financial journey. And if you're looking at your finances and just seeing it only from the practical side of, mm -hmm. I, I don't have enough income to cover my expenses. Again, just releasing it and accepting that grace, that transforming grace that only comes from God. That's the way that we can start to transform our financial situations. Um, it, I think it's, I mean, it's so easy to get on Google and search up like, how do I do this with my finances? <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I am a culprit of that too. I do that all the time. When, when I come at a situation, sometimes I forget that I have a father who has all the answers and who gives me the peace that I need to get through these dark times that I, that I face. And uh, it's, it's funny that Google is such a great resource. <laughs> so can, you know, lead us in the wrong direction uh, when, when really a lot of times we really just need Christ. Yeah. There, there's uh, so it's funny. I was actually reading his book this morning. I'm on, I think the, yeah. I'm about 90% of the way through. And one of yes. the, yeah, one of the, uh, one of his uh, phrases that I highlighted was, it was something like discontentment is the soil that, um, that the love of money is rooted in. And oh, yeah. I was like, whoa, that's a, that's a pretty, that's a yeah. pretty tall order, but it, it really shapes the framework when someone starts thinking, oh man, I just, I wish I had this. And, and I, I, I felt like this a lot whenever I was pursuing financial independence, right? It was like, man, if we just had another house or if we could just do another flip or it, right. I think people call this the golden handcuffs. It's like, if I could just do one more year and, mm -hmm. Yeah, one more, one more, and it's and I think it's it it's that discontentment. It's it's not it's not really believing that God is enough, right? A lot of times when I work with my clients, I, I ask them like, "How much is enough?" And they never have an answer because <laughs> there's never enough, right? Most people, when I say, if you ask people uh, with with a million, "Hey, would you, are you ready to retire? Do you feel comfortable?" They say, "No, I really need another million. But then you ask people who are in the same situation with five million and say, "Well, I just need another million, and then I then I feel like I can retire." It's never it's never enough. They never feel like they have 
uh, enough to to do you know what uh, what they want to do. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember. I don't have the book in front of me, um, and so I can't remember the title right now. There's a book, um, another faith and finance book, and they say instead of setting um, like a how much should I give goal, it's there's a the, kind of flipping the script on how much should I save? Like how much do I need for myself? And then looking at that and then saying, okay, now I'm, I'm going to give everything else away in a mm. sense. So really kind of setting that finish line for yourself, um, not based on what, the idea of like, oh, I'm going to give 10% and that's it. But um, like, I'm going to keep maybe like 40% of my income and give away the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I really like, I'm trying to, I used, I used to have the book. I have a bunch of books over here. Yeah, I was listening to Bob Lodick. I think his podcast or, yeah. or channel is, is is it Seed Time? Yeah, Seed Time Money. Seed Time Money. And he was talking about net. He, he, he stopped tracking net worth and he started tracking net given. And that yeah. really convicted me because I thought, man, I am yes. I am how am I tracking what matters in eternity? Mm -hmm. And which is not net net worth. God doesn't view us in terms of how much we have in our bank accounts, wow. right? But he but there is there is scripture and a scriptural basis to make for how much we give and store up what what God calls true riches, right? For those those in eternity, right? How we're ministering the gospel and how we're spreading His message of of love and grace uh, to those who who need it the most. And so I thought that was I thought that was pretty good. Um, I know wow. I think I think you've talked to him before. Um, yep. but I, I want to talk, uh, just briefly about like, what are some practical things that we mm -hmm. can do to redeem our role as stewards? Yeah, honestly. So I, after seeing his video about the net given, he also has a book. I have it here too. Lots of books. Um, he, him and his wife wrote a book recently and came out this year and they kind of explained more about why they do this. And it is such a practical way just to create a line in your budget of everything that you give away. Like whether it is like to an actual nonprofit or church or any, anything like that, or whether it's like, Hey, I took my friend out to lunch. That's part of my giving this year. Mm. It's kind of to refocus yourself. It's not to track yourself and to say like, Oh, I, I want to reach this much. And I want to show everyone how good I am at giving. But it is, it's to refocus your heart on how can I be others focus, you mm. know, just practically going through and combing through your expenses. You might be surprised and maybe a little ashamed about how much you don't give to others and just how much you don't give away. You might think that you're a generous person, but it might shock you. It definitely shocked me when I went through and, and actually started tracking my spending and and I did, I did feel a little bit of shame because I think Christians really should be the most generous people out there. Like, mm. like flat out, we should be the people out there who are just giving loads of money away because that's what Jesus did. You know, Jesus went and abolished the law of Moses that we had back in the Old Testament. And one of the cool things that he did was he took all of these laws that were there and he kind of like, like Ele elevated them. Yeah. Yeah. Elevated, yeah. <laughs> you know, okay, well, yeah, you shouldn't murder someone, but you also shouldn't think poorly about them. Oh, mm. that's a lot harder than not murdering my sister or brother or husband or wife, you know, the people that irritate us. Yeah. And so, you know, we were set in the, the Mosaic law. We had the 10%, you know, okay, we should give 10%. Jesus never, he never put an amount or anything. It wasn't like, okay, now you have 20%. Mm -hmm. But he, with his life, practically, he showed his generosity mm. by sacrificing and giving to those in need. And I think we need to elevate that. We shouldn't stop at 10%. We should go above and beyond. And so a practical way to do that is go through your finances, mm -hmm. figure out how much you're giving and, and don't again, like accept the grace that God has given you and, and start to elevate that, you know, challenge yourself. Okay. Maybe I'm only giving 8%. Can I bump it up to that 10%? Maybe next year give 11 or just, you know, keep rolling that ball up to become more generous. And, and it's just, just, it's a really easy, practical way. If, if you out there are kind of more of a numbers person and like to look at spreadsheets, just start tracking it. I mean, it definitely has encouraged my husband and I to 
seek out new and creative ways to to be more generous. Hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of, especially Christians, right, when it comes to generosity, they they get hung up on the 10%. Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny, a couple of years ago, I was teaching at a Bible college, and a lot of the students, we had a little after after hour session, a lot of the students wanted to know, like, hey, should I give on the gross or the net? Or mm -hmm. if I if I make us, you know, make some money on my property, should I give 10% of that? And I was like, where's your heart at? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was kind of chuckling inside, but I was thinking, like, is your heart in generosity? Like, do you want to give because... You believe yeah. that you believe that you, you just want to be generous because that's what God commands or is, are you just trying to get by on the on the yeah check off the box and just do the least least you can. And so yeah. I think it's really a heart issue and it's a it's a um, it's an issue of the heart where you think is is what's my motivation in doing this is my motivation in giving so that I can store up true riches in heaven or is my yeah. motivation in giving so I can check off the box and just. Uh, you know, do the right work according to, you know, scripture. But I think that gets into like a works-based gospel, which I don't think is the way that um, we should view our, our relationship with Christ. It should be more of a doing it out of love and not out of uh, yeah. obligation. Yeah. Paul says that we should give what, you know, each, each believer should give what they feel called to give. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't, you know, okay, sure. Like Sally's giving 20% of her income and you're only able to give 4% you shouldn't feel bad that you're not giving a large amount. You know, the poor widow who only gave like the two coins, she mm -hmm. was considered more generous than the Pharisees who were giving like tons of money. So when you sit down and look at your budget and determine what you're able to give, don't feel bad if it's only a little bit of your income, but you should challenge yourself and, and consider what are you already spending your money on that maybe you don't need to be, you know, are you trying to live a certain lifestyle that isn't really God focused and can you refocus and reallocate your finances to be more generous and to look for those opportunities to participate in the kingdom? I think that's the coolest part about our finances is that it's such a cool way that we get to participate and we're invited to be a part of these kingdom building activities. Mm. I think that's like when we start to think about our money more practically like that, not in, not in a way of like, how can I store up more in my bank account, but how can I have more money to go and pour out to others? Yeah. Like that's, what's so cool about money management from a biblical perspective is we have this bigger purpose for it. Yeah. I think uh, one of the scriptures that comes to mind is first Corinthians in, in 10. It says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And I think that really sums up this, this section, but how can I spend my income? How can I redeem my role as a steward? It's just whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Um, so um, now I want to, uh, I want to jump into um, our, our second, the second part here. What does it mean to honor the Lord with all of your wealth? So Proverbs 3, 9 says, uh, talks about honoring the Lord with all of your wealth. Um, and and a, a question that I get quite often, which ties in uh, perfectly here is, right, I, I tithe, isn't that enough? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I want to get your thoughts on uh, when, when, when people say, you know, I'm a tither and, um, you know, and I give. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've heard, uh, I think it's the Barna study that talks about, um, you know, a very small percentage of church goes actually tithe and give 10% or more. Uh, mm -hmm. But what, what are your thoughts on this? You know, I, I tithe, isn't that enough? Yeah. Um, I actually, I should pull it up. I, I wrote an article um, a little bit ago and started collecting all sorts of different facts out there, um, stats about tithing. And it was actually pretty sad. It's, it's something like less than 3% um, of Christians actually give a full 10%. Mm -hmm. um, and, or it, it, it's something like that where it's like, man, again, like I, I really do believe that God asks us to be the most generous people out there with our time and our energy and with the resources, with our money um, that he's given us. And it's kind of, I mean, I keep using this word only because right now it's kind of the, the word that I've been, that's been put on my heart when I think about like giving is that we, it, it is kind of shameful when mm. 
when we have a lot of money, when, especially if you live in the United States, like we are the, the top of the top, you know, if you live in the U S you are bound to be some of the wealthiest people in the world. And as believers, you know, we should be giving more. And so when, when you say like, I'm a tither and yeah, like God thinks I'm really great because of it, I would check your heart, you know, check your heart and, and ask God, is he calling you to give more? Is he calling you to do something different? Maybe even with just your time. Um, Cause sometimes I think too, like Nicodemus, I don't know. I thought this was a really cool example in, um, if anybody watches the chosen, there's um, an episode where Nicodemus uh, gives, he, Jesus asks him to be a part of his mission. And so Nicodemus, instead of going physically with Jesus and the rest of the disciples, mm. he leaves money by the fountain for Jesus and kind of like gives to the ministry, but he doesn't actually physically participate. Mm. And so sometimes we as Christians say, okay, yeah, I'm going to tithe my 10% or maybe even more or less. I'm going to give to the ministry of God, but we stay behind the doors in our homes where we're comfortable instead of going out and participating physically in the mission um, of the kingdom of God. Mm. So maybe God isn't asking you actually to give physically more money or, you know, give money, but physically give your time and your energy yeah. in the kingdom. So there's, there's so many different ways that you can participate. It's not just money and it's not just actually doing things, but it's a combination, I think of both. And, and we need to kind of balance that out. Yeah. I think going back to that scripture, honor the Lord with, with all of your wealth. I, <laughs> I, I think of uh first Timothy six and uh, Paul's commanding Timothy, uh, you know, he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. And I think it, 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 it almost paints this, uh, this pridefulness, right? Because he's saying, don't put your hope in wealth, but also don't be arrogant. And if I'm, if I'm reading between the lines here, <laughs> uh, Paul is saying, basically, stop being proud of your wealth. And stop putting your hope in it, but start being generous. And, and he says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Uh, coming back to what you were saying about, it's not just about giving away money or possessions. Yeah. It could also be your time, your talent, your treasure. So your time. Are there ways that I can give of my time when it hurts, right? So we just had, <laughs> we just had a, a baby girl about a year ago. Yeah. And uh, our time is like so sacred now. And uh, but uh, yeah, I, I know I know I think um, David talks about uh, buying uh, buying land. Uh, it, it, this is in, in in the Old Testament. David talks about buying land to build an altar for the threshing floor. And, mm -hmm. and the, the gentleman who he's buying it from says, oh, you can just have it. And he says, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to take this yeah. if it doesn't cost me something. And I, and I go back to that scripture like, man, this. And, and, and the perfect example of this is stewardship in my life is, man, when our baby's crying at three in the morning, <laughs> do I go, do I get up first? I heard uh, another YouTuber talk about like, do I, do I, am I, am I the first one to get up and say, no, honey, let me, let me take this one. Am I generous in those good works? Right. Cause stewardship I think starts in the home. So anyway, um, not, not to, not to get too convicted on everyone, but, <laughs> Uh, but to finish that scripture out, command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So going back to what we talked about, are we, are we looking at every decision in light of eternity? And I think, that's, I think that's what it really means to honor the Lord with all of your wealth. So when people ask, like, I tithe, isn't that enough? I think... It, you know, if that's where your heart is right now, then pray that God will mature and, and give you clarity and also give you love uh, for mm -hmm. those around you. Um, but but another another kind of common theme um, and another area that I want to talk about is how can I um, how can I give when I feel stretched thin? Right. How can I honor the Lord with all of my wealth when I feel stretched thin? So this would be someone maybe who kind of like the the woman uh, with the two mites, right? She Maybe she felt stretched thin. But I want to hear what your thoughts are on that and maybe some practical ways of how you can honor the Lord when someone feels stretched thin. Yeah. I think that poor widow is a really great example. I mean, just giving what you can. 
Um, one exercise that I walk all of my coaching clients through is just, again, like that practice of combing through your expenses. So I, I physically have them write out all of their expenses for at least the past three months. And it gives them a picture of where their money is already going, where they're spending their money. This, even though it is a very tedious process, is one of the most eye-opening exercises that all of my clients go through because again, many of us don't realize where our money is going. Mm. We don't know. And when I, this before I was ever a money coach, when I first did this, I realized that I was spending hundreds of dollars on silly things like going out for coffee or stopping to get like a bagel or a muffin or something while I was driving around. And once I saw that, because my husband and I were trying to find ways that we could do things like we love hosting dinners for people. Like we love inviting people into our home like once a week and just making a nice meal for them. Now that costs money. Hmm. And we felt really strapped thin to be able to do those things. But when I started combing through our finances to find out that I was spending hundreds of dollars on little purchases like coffee and bagels and things like that, I was shocked. Um, but it was such an easy way to say, okay, I can stop going out for coffee. I have coffee at home. The office that I was working at at the time had free coffee literally <laughs> waiting for me there. Why did I need to go spend like five to $10 a day on coffee and eating out? So that was such an easy, practical way to find that money that I already had hmm. to be able to go and give like, such a simple way. We don't have to bring in more money. We didn't have to do anything to, you know, we didn't have to go sell stuff or whatever. Those are things you can do. And I always encourage people to look for fun side hustles, um, whether it's like Uber Eats or DoorDash and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of times we already have the money that we need in order to be generous people. We just need to find contentment. Like again, going back to that beginning, um, find contentment in the things that we already have and reallocate the funds that, that are already coming in. Yeah, when you take people through this process of allocating and budgeting and, and really identifying, I, I think part of that is understanding your priorities. And yes. I, I know priorities can be kind of misconstrued, especially in the heart of the Christian, I think because we have uh, we have a dual nature, right? We know, that we, we live in this present world, but we're not, we're not this is not our home. But we, but we, we should be living in light of eternity, eternity. And so when we think about our priority of, I know this, I think about this a lot when I, when I think about giving, is this giving decision, is it giving, am I giving based on what God, what, what's important to God's heart? And, and when I think about that, it's how, how is this, how am I building up for myself treasures in heaven? Right. So if every decision I make is based on building up true riches in heaven, then giving will be easy. Right. But if I think mm -hmm. about my life in this short term, I think someone told me one time uh, m most people think about their life or most people should think about their life as a dot and eternity as a line, as an extended line. Uh -huh. And I think people don't necessarily examine or, or think about their life in light of eternity. They, they are consider solely focused on their own life. And, and this goes back, I think, to, to discontentment. And not having when you, when you're discontent, I think you're you're focused on yourself. You're not necessarily focused on how can I be generous to other people. Mm -hmm. There's a scripture that uh, in Second Corinthians, um, uh, he's talking about you'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through and through the generosity that your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And I think there's two keys there. One is gratitude. He talks about generosity. Um, yeah. But then he also talks, uh, sorry, he talks about generosity and then he also talks about gratitude. So I think those are two keys to fight against discontentment, right? So if I'm generous and I'm always looking out and not looking, always, always looking in, then I'll constantly be thinking, how can I help other people? How can I be a blessing to other people? I mean, he says in this, in this passage, so that you can be, you, you, you will be made rich so that you can be generous on every occasion. That means we should be looking for opportunities to bless people, be looking for opportunities to be a blessing. And then the second part of that is that with a generosity, the generosity results 
in thanksgiving to God. And so again, I think when you're living with that extended hand and open heart, you're, you're looking to how can I serve other people? But that also makes you more thankful for the life that you have. And you're not looking at other people like on social media and saying, man, I wish I had that life. You're saying, man, how can I, how can I find other people who are less fortunate that I can bless Right? Who can I bless today and who can I be a blessing to? And then that will result in thanksgiving to God, meaning that will actually change your heart to be more thankful and be, I think, more generous. So yeah. I think, I think that, that it's all tied together, generosity, gratitude, and contentment. Absolutely. Yeah, I, it really is true. Just like Paul uh, David Tripp says in his book that discontentment is that soil that all these issues breed out from. Mm. You know, it, when we are discontent, we, I mean, I think about right now too, sometimes I feel discontent in the house that we live in and I'm like ready to move out and I get so anxious and it, it just breeds all these thoughts of like, okay, well, how can I make more money? Okay, well, how can mm. I, what should I do with my time differently to do this and to accomplish that? And, and it, I get this anxiety that makes me think that our finances are actually a problem. <laughs> and then mm. I go and look at them and I'm like, you know, we don't like our house is fine. Like we're, we're happy here. It's perfect size for us. We, we live in a great area. And, and then once I start thinking about all those things to be thankful about in the place that we're at, it's just like all of that kind of just dissipates. It's like, oh, okay, I can, I can relax. I can have that peace and the Holy spirit can just fill me with joy. And it really does. When, when we, when we feel discontent, it just spirals into all these other issues. Like everything else becomes a problem. Hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I think being being a new dad has really changed my heart uh, to to really think about how God thinks about me. Uh, sometimes my daughter will start, you know, getting frustrated, and she'll be holding on to something. Like uh, this is a perfect example. She was this this afternoon. She was holding on to a wrapper, and, and she knew that there was food inside, but she was holding on to it so tight, like she wanted to make it explode so that she could eat it. But what she didn't see is just to, like literally just to the left of her, I was holding that food in my hand so she could eat it. And so I think this is a per perfect example, right? We're, we're so tight. We hold everything so tight to our to ourselves and we think, man, I just need this to work. I just need to make it work on my own. And we can't even focus. We can't even look to see like, man, God's already provided for yeah. us in our lives. So anyway. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really, I mean, when you're saying that too, when our hands are holding tightly, like you think about it, like physically, like if you look mm -hmm. at your hands, holding onto something tightly, you have no ability to grab something new. You know, when, when God wants to give you something new, like mm. there's wants to give to us abundantly. But when we hold on to what we have right now, we have no room to, yeah. uh, to take that new thing. We have to let go in order to take what God wants to give us. Mm. And I, I just, I like that image of your daughter just holding on <laughs> Like, no, look, I'm trying to put this in yeah. <laughs> open, let go of that thing. And I'm going to give you something like, hmm. oh, such a good, such a good image. Yeah. So um, I, as we close out this, this section, I want to talk just practical. Um, mm -hmm. So what are some practical things that uh, we can do, our listeners can do to stop focusing on ourselves, but be more generous? I think one is gratitude. And that just mm -hmm. starts with how, you know, Instead of saying, man, man, like, what can I do today to, uh, to you know, make my storehouses bigger? But what are some, what are, um, what are ways that I can be a blessing today, right? So, what are some other practical things that people can do to have more of a generosity heart? Yeah, I, I like, I love that idea. I think making a list first off of all the things that you are thankful for. When I, when I start to spiral out and start to get discontent with my current situation. I, I like either out loud will start saying like, I'm thankful for this, Lord, I'm mm. thankful for this. And, and I'll, I'll speak it or I'll write it out and start to look at, oh my gosh, I, I have so much to be thankful for. Mm. Um, so starting out with that list and prayer, I mean, prayer is so important. I, I think some, sometimes we think that prayer isn't always like the practical thing to do, but prayer really is like, it is a tool. It is a weapon that we can use fighting against these thoughts of discontentment and worry and anxiety and, and even sadness when we, when we feel depressed about our situations is praying and asking God for that peace. Those are really practical things. Mm, yeah. I like that. I think, um, 
right, we're, we're commanded to, to pray continuously, right, to always be praying. And I think especially in those little moments, right, like you would just call out to a friend, right? Ah. I, I do this often when I'm walking at back and forth on our property. I just, I'll just say, like, God, please give me wisdom for this situation. And just that, just a simple little prayer like that. God, just mm -hmm. please give me wisdom for this situation, knowing that I can't I can do it on my own. So I think that's great. Writing everything down that you're thankful for and then just... I think meditating on what you're thankful for can really change your mm -hmm. outlook and perspective on life. So I love that idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna, I wanna uh, shift gears a little bit here. Now I wanna talk about the three most overlooked areas of being a faithful financial steward. And I know we both probably have stories uh, <laughs> in our own personal life and also in our profession, me being a financial advisor and you being a money coach, uh, of just you know how can we be faithful financial stewards in the way that even we maybe we operate our business, right? So obviously I'm a, a Christian financial advisor. You're a faith-based money coach. We integrate our faith uh, with our finances, but also in our life, but also in the lives of our clients. So I want to talk here, what are some of the areas of uh, faithful financial stewardship? The first one I think is giving. So values-based giving. The second is values-based spending. And then the yeah. third is values-based investing. And again, I just want to paint it in light of eternity, right? What do I value, right? We mm -hmm. talk about values-based giving, values-based spending, values-based investing. The question is, what do you value? Do you value mm -hmm. this life or do you value eternity, right? Heaven. Uh, do you value mammon, this this world's monetary system, or do you uh, do you value God? Do you value worldly wealth or do you value the true riches in heaven? So, you can start us off. Uh, how how should we be how should we be thinking? about values-based giving. Yeah. I, I like how you compared like you're, you know, one or the other, you're kind of doing one or the other. One, I think it's actually, it might be Paul David Tripp who says in his book, Redeeming Your Finances, when you spend money, you're either going to build your kingdom or God's kingdom, like no matter what, whether you like recognize it or not. And so when you're giving money, it's kind of the same thing. You give to build up God's kingdom or maybe even someone else's kingdom. Mm. So we have to be kind of cognizant of that as we give our dollars and, and just be prayerful over where we're spending them. Obviously, first and foremost is God's mission. God's first way to redeem and to reach the world is through his church. And so mm. if you're not giving to your church, I would start there. Like values-based giving, like figuring out how you can be a part of God's kingdom is to give to the church. And so Building up your local community church that you're a part of is a really great way. They have so many like ministries and resources that they need funding for to be able to go and reach the community. And so starting there with the church is a great way, but then also looking for other organizations who are kingdom focused, who are looking to impact the world for Christ. And it takes research to look for those for those ministries and for those nonprofits, but that is how we can really be focused on giving for Christ. But also like, I think practically like in your day-to-day -day life too, like when you're at work and you see a coworker who is feeling down that day, come out to lunch, buy him a coffee. That's another way to just give based on how Christ would give. He would see a need and meet that need where that person is at and not like, oh, I actually have to give to my church so that they can give to you. And it's like, no, you're right there. Like be <laughs> the hands and feet of Christ right where you're at too. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of times when we talk about, uh, you know, value, I think we have to we have to talk about love. And obviously yeah. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about if I were to be generous and give away everything I own to the poor, which sounds like a good thing without love, it would be meaningless, right? It would be, there would be nothing of value there. And so I think we have to understand first our heart motive, right? So values based giving in my, in my opinion is love based giving, right? Am I giving yes. because I love God and because I want to honor him and I want to be a good steward, right? This, this idea of stewardship comes back or am I giving because I feel like I'm checking the box <laughs> again. Yep. So I think yep. values based giving really comes back to what do I value? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think like 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 Paul mentioned here in, in First Corinthians 13, you can be generous and you can give away everything you own to the poor. But if you don't have love, what is it? What is it? What is it worth it all for? Right. So I think coming back to do, am I doing this because I love God's heart and I want to be a person after God's own heart? Or am I doing this just, just to check the box? I think that's yeah. really important. 
Definitely. I think a lot of us do get caught up in just checking the box. Oh, God wants me to be generous. So, oh, this missionary comes along. I'm just going to give to that person. And it's mm -hmm. not to say that that's like you're wrong and you're bad for doing that, but it, it is meaningless that in, in that sense, because God wants you to be more thoughtful about where you're giving your dollars. Yeah. There's another a couple of other scriptures I want to highlight. A generous person will, will prosper. And, and I know that sounds like you might just be doing it to get something out of get it. Something. <laughs> but the second half of that scripture, this is in Proverbs eleven twenty five, says, Who, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And mm -hmm. I, I just love that phrasing. I think it's really beautiful, especially yeah. in today's, in today's world where everybody feels like we're striving or it's like hustle culture or side gigs and everybody's yeah. like, there's like no time for what we really, what really is meaningful in this life, like family and friendships and, and God, I think that that phrasing, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I think that, again, it ties back into, am I focused on refreshing myself? Am I just focused on giving to myself to make myself feel better? Or am I focused on others? So I think, yeah, I think uh, that's a good point you make about values-based giving. And from a, from a practical standpoint, I think, you know, like you said, giving to your church is a great place to start because they're in and out of the, the community, most likely where you live. Uh, what are some other ways you can be uh, intentional with your giving? Yeah. Um, I think writing a list, like first thinking about all of the areas that you are passionate about, because there are tons of ministries and nonprofits and different organizations that we can mm -hmm. give to. I think that's, it, it is really easy to give today because we're kind of bombarded by all these different places where mm -hmm. we can give. And I don't think that each believer is called to give to every mission out there. I mm -hmm. mean, there's, it, it can be overseas stuff. It can be, um, you know, human trafficking. It could be suicide prevention. There's so many different areas that we can give to, but what do you feel called to give to what really like shakes you up and rattles you mm. when you hear like yeah there's like everybody like this amount of people deal with depression and, and suicidal thoughts well if that is something that you maybe even like have dealt with yourself or have someone in your family who has dealt with it then maybe that's where god is calling you to give and, and maybe not to animal rights activists mm. and things like that so what is it you, you are passionate about and, and make a list and pray over it and ask God where he's calling you to give your dollars. Yeah. I th and th this is going to tie into the next one about values-based spending. But w one question I, th I think that maybe many of the listeners and viewers will have is mm -hmm. how do I balance mm -hmm. giving? <laughs> I mean, cause it, you know, if, if it, you know, some of us could give large amounts and some of us can give small amounts, but each of us know what we can and cannot give. But also how do you balance like, okay, I'm not going to do this thing because I because I'm going to give it now, and that goes and that ties into our second piece here, uh, values based spending. But I think about Proverbs three. There's a scripture he says, "Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act." And I think that's that's a hard um, scripture to read because a lot of times we do have the power, especially Americans. We are so blessed to be to live in America, and m many of us are fortunate. So when when it's in our power to act you know the proverb says don't don't withhold good so how do you balance like okay how, what you know how much is enough right to live on and then how much is enough uh, to give on yeah i don't think the answer necessarily will be straightforward like oh you're only supposed to keep this percentage of your income in order to live off of because mm -hmm. again yeah that will differ per person what your income is like where you live um and so it will be very specific to your situation. But I think when it when we ask that question of how much is enough, again, we have to be very intentional about what we're giving. Uh, one of my clients, she is the category in her budget that she always overspends on is giving, which is I, I tell her, I'm like, that is a really good problem to have because if you're going to have any kind of money problem, I would rather see you over giving than, you know, over spending on yourself for different things. So, but we, we are, we're talking through just some very practical ways that she can kind of almost like rein it in because 
it's a little obsessive. I mean, it's, it's a good problem to have. And so it's, it's kind of funny to talk about because it's like, oh, stop giving so much. But one thing that she deals with or struggles with is like, oh, I want to thank this person for something. I have to give them a gift of $50 because of their small act of generosity to me. And I'm like, okay, well, let's think about this more. Like, what, what are you giving her and why are you giving it to her? And so she actually sent me a list of all the people that she's giving gifts to. And I challenged her to think about the gifts that she's actually giving to those people. And I'm like, are they going to appreciate this gift? Like, sure, you could give them a gift card, but what if, took the time to find out what their favorite thing was and Mm. and really were intentional about that thing and she actually ended up like saving a little like almost a hundred dollars in total with all these gifts because she was just more intentional and spent time with these people and bought them meals and sat down with them instead Mm. of giving them money again like not just checking off the box and so that intentionality is really what's important because god God sees people's hearts. He understands like what they actually need because a Mm. lot of times what people need isn't more money. It's love. It's the attention. It's um, truth. I mean, just sitting down and telling people truth in love is is really, really valuable. Um, And so that's honestly, when I walk clients through just this exercise of, of how do we spend our money? How do we discern where to spend our money? That first thing that I always encourage people to do is just get to know God more because when we understand his heart for people, we start to have his heart for people. You know, Mm. we start to see people through his eyes and recognize like money's not going to solve everybody's problem, but I can maybe buy something for them or spend time with them. Just being really intentional about that instead of just throwing more money at a problem because that's not going to solve it. Yeah, I think a lot of what you mentioned about intentionality, I think that that really drives home with me because as givers, I think we can, you know, just say, oh, I'm just giving to the church and they'll take care of it. But we don't necessarily are, you know, intimately involved with how, you know, are we, do we know that person? Right. So, so values-based giving, I think is important for us to understand like what, what, what it's really important to us. And I think we, I think we actually become more thankful in that generosity because we can actually see the impact, right? Like you mentioned, if you're passionate about animals and you're not giving to an animal shelter, maybe you should, or maybe you should donate your time or donate your finances to that. So you can actually see the joy that people get from, uh, from adopting animals or adopting an animal yourself. So, um, okay. So now I want to talk about values-based spending, Right. So, uh, cont- again, we, we talk about contentment and discontentment. And I think, you know, I mentioned that the discontentment is a soil in which the love of money grows. Uh, P- Paul um, from the Bible says that godliness with contentment is great gain. So how do we balance, uh, you know, values based spending? Right. What is important to us in just the way we spend, not necessarily the way we give, but just in uh, categories of, you know, food, groceries, gas, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Again, when I, when I walk clients through this process, the first one starts with what, you know, just understanding God, like understanding his heart. Um, the next one is actually understanding your unique calling, whatever it is that you are called to, whether it is a parent or what it is like vocationally, like for example, I, as a money coach want to invest in and spend my money on things that will help build up this calling that I have. And so I spend a a decent amount of money on education. Like I want to educate myself so that I can teach people really excellently about how to manage their money. And so I spend money on that kind of stuff. If you're a parent, you're going to be spending more time and money on, on things for your children. And, and again, it's not just throwing money at them, but Mm. why don't you spend some time and money going to the zoo with your kids that might be more money than just staying at home, but it might be this really awesome experience and bonding time for you as a family. Hmm. And so again, just going back to that intentionality and what is it you're called to? And so the Proverbs 31 woman is actually a really good example of this. If you, if you haven't ever like studied that scripture, even if you're a man, um, it's a really good way to see how she prioritized her family and then she prioritized others. And, and it was just a really cool way that she looked at her expenses and said, 
Like how can I spend it on those things that I really, really value? And so family is one of those things for most of us as believers that we want to pour in and invest in. And so just making sure that you're taking that time to spend um, on meals with your family. So that might mean like, you know, having a specific grocery or restaurant budget to have that quality time together. But if you're not foodies, maybe it's going on adventures and um, going out and doing things in the community together. So just thinking about what is it that you're uniquely called to, and that will actually guide the way that you spend your money a lot. And, and you want to like, again, think about the future too. So we want to prioritize like saving for our future. So again, if you value your children, um, this, this kind of sounds but the way I'm about to say this, about <laughs> value your children. but if you, if you want to show, do a, um, if you want to practically show your kids that you love them, instead of maybe buying them the newest iPhone recently, why don't you spend and save that money for their college education? You know, put that aside because again, like just buying them things is not going to solve anything. Like thinking about the future and investing in that is also a really great way to think about the values that you have for your family. Hmm. Yeah. I want to challenge all the men, uh, you know, couldn't agree more with what you're saying, Katie, but I want to challenge all the men as well to read Proverbs 31 because I actually had a client uh, on Sunday, we were talking and he said, have you ever thought about the Proverbs 31 man? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said that in Proverbs 31, it says that the man, the, her, her yeah. husband was known at the city gates. Yeah. And I thought, and he was explaining basically that to be known at the city gates was meaning he, they would know what to allow in and what to allow out or to keep mm -hmm. out of the city. And also they were yeah. kind of viewed as more of a righteous judge um, to, to, to have that place. And so it kind of, uh, flip Proverbs 31 yeah. on the head, and I, yeah. start, I started really thinking about that, man, am I am I a Proverbs 31 man? Am I known at the city gates? Mm -hmm. Do people know me as a person of integrity, as a person of, of character, as a person who That's good. Uh, has values? So yeah, uh, so we're, we're talking about the three most overlooked areas of faithful financial stewardship. We've talked about values-based giving. We've talked about values-based spending. I want to end it here with values-based investing, which is obviously something I'm very passionate about. Values-based investing, biblically responsible investing. This is, again, just aligning our faith values with our money. And for those who haven't heard about values-based investing, I'll just give you a brief overview. But values-based investing is really focused on am I, are the companies that, are in, that I'm invested in, in my 401k, and in my retirement accounts, in my brokerage accounts, invested for God's glory. Meaning, would any of these companies, would God own these companies? Would mm -hmm. he be happy wow. with, with these companies that I'm owning? And maybe you haven't looked at the investments in your retirement account, and you don't know if, you're, if the companies you own are, are profiting from taking life or from people's addictions or from, you know, some of these, some of these things that I think would, would hurt the heart of God. Uh, so that's what values-based investing, but not, not only just... Uh, avoiding um, companies, but it's also embracing companies, right? Are these companies, would I be, would God be proud to own these companies? If God comes back, would I, would he be proud that I own this company that makes, um, you know, abortion drugs, for example, uh, or, or would he be, would he be proud for, uh, or would I be proud to work there? Right. That's, that's another, another thing I like to say, would I be proud to yeah. work for this company that I own in my investment account? Or are they known for, you know, child labor labor or treating their employees you know not fairly so that's oh, really yeah, that's that's, that's really about values-based investing not not necessarily just avoiding things but also embracing things right does this does this company honor god in the way that it treats its employees treats its staff treats its uh customers um so that's that's what i would say is the third area that's probably most commonly overlooked in the area of fi faithful financial stewardship, values-based investing, meaning putting God, would God be happy with the way that I'm investing his money? And when he comes, he, I know he's expecting a return, but he will, will he be happy in the way that I've invested his money? So I think those are the three areas uh, most commonly overlooked, values-based giving, values-based spending, and values-based investing. Well, we are uh, very close to the top of the hour, uh, Katie. So I want to just say thank you so much for joining me on the brighter wealth show uh where can people find you if they want to learn more about uh, uh katie jones or agape investing or your faith-based money coach program yeah definitely 
Um, if you want to learn more about money coaching or just want some more resources, I have tons of free resources um, on becoming an excellent money manager over at my website, Agape Invests, I-N-V-E-S-T-S. -E um, so you can definitely go check me out there. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has about anything that we talked about. I mean, I love continuing the conversation. So feel free and shoot me an email or um, message me on Instagram or anything like that. And I'd be happy to chat. Well, thanks again, Katie. I definitely recommend checking out Agape Invest. She has some great content, some great material on her website. Uh, she obviously is a follower of Christ and wants to help Christians become brighter stewards of God's wealth, which is something I'm passionate about at Brighter Wealth. So if you're interested, interested to learn more about Brighter Wealth, you can visit brighterwealth.net. Uh, for everyone listening today, I just wanted to say thanks for joining us on the live stream, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, David. Thanks. See you later. Bye-bye.